And I'd like to um, just make sure, uh, Courtney, are you set to start recording? Yes, we're good. Okay, wonderful. Well, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the first um, Library Publishing Coalition webinar of the fall 2016 season. Uh, the title of today's session is Open Access Journal Publishing, DOAJ Indexing and Best Practice. Um, getting your open access journal indexed by the Directory of Open Access Journals is becoming increasingly important as many organizations and funding agencies are now mandating that research is published in a journal included in DOAJ. So today we're going to be discussing the requirements for inclusion in DOAJ and some best practice recommendations, including um, the criteria for the DOAJ seal. Uh, I'm Kate McCready from the University of Minnesota and I'll be moderating this session. Uh, which is sponsored by the Library Publishing Coalition's Professional Development Committee. I encourage all of you to use the chat fe feature on the screen to submit questions during the presentation. I'll help moderate questions at the end of this presentation. And at the end, um, you're welcome to ask questions with your voice. Um, but during the session, if you please keep your microphone muted um, until you're ready to ask a question, that would, that would help with the session logistics. So I would like to introduce Judith Barnsby. Uh, Judith has over 20 years of experience in the scholarly publishing industry, uh, working for a range of nonprofit society publishers and service providers. She has taken a keen interest in publishing standards and protocols and has served on the board of the Clocks Preservation Service. She is one of the editorial team at DOAJ responsible for overseeing the review of journals for the index. She was going to be joined by Dominic Mitchell uh, today as her co-presenter, but he is unable to make it due to a, a flight issue. So Judith will be carrying the day. Thank you so much, Judith. And That's I will, okay. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Um, so hello, everybody. Um, I, I'm going to be doing this on my own, so hopefully uh, you won't get fed up with my voice um, before the end of it. So I'll... Uh, just go straight in. Um, I'm going to quickly uh, talk about um, DOAJ and its mission. I'm sure most of you are aware of DOAJ and what we do, um, but I'll just briefly talk about that uh, and talk about why you should apply for indexing if you haven't already, um, and then talk about the, what a journal needs to be included in DOAJ and some uh, best practice recommendations, um, moving on to the DOAJ seal, which we award to uh, journals that um, operate best practice in open access publishing. So a little bit um, of history. DOAJ has been going for 13 years, if I can count correctly, um, and started with 300 titles. Um, we are, as I'm sure you know, um, community curated, which means that we have um, a community of volunteers who work with a small number of staff to review journals for inclusion in the database. We're a not-for-profit organisation. We're funded um, entirely by membership and subscription. Um, and we aim to include only high quality titles across the wide range of scholarly disciplines. Um, we at the moment have over 9,000 journals in the database, um, which is slightly reduced from, well, quite a lot reduced from the height um, before we introduced new um, criteria and invited journals to reapply the listing, um, we had well over 10,000 and we actually removed more than 3,000 journals um, earlier this year who had not reapplied for indexing. And we have more than 2 million links to full text open access articles. Um, so the most journals in DOAJ, uh, this is the top 10. Um, Brazil is the country with the, uh, the highest number. Um, and you might think, well, why Brazil? 
um, but uh, they have a very high percentage of their journals that are published in open access. I'm not sure of the exact number. Um, I looked online, I got varying figures between 70 and 97% of their journals being published in open access. So it's not surprising that uh, they would be at the top of the list, um, followed by the UK and the US. Um, and at the top of the screen, you can see the, the current um, number of the journals, almost 6,500 are searchable at article level, which means that those journals have provided us with metadata for the articles that they've published. And we have 128 countries in the database that have one or more journals um, that we have indexed. And uh, we have a project ongoing at the moment uh, funded by the IDRC in uh, Canada to increase um, inclusion from the so-called Global South. So we're working with people in China, in India, in South America, um, and the Middle East and Africa to try and increase the numbers of journals, good quality journals that are included from those regions. So our mission to develop a reliable directory of online open access journals um, to increase their visibility, their attraction, their discoverability. And ideally, we want to be the starting point for information searches for quality open access journal content. Um, so in a nutshell, helping readers to find quality material, helping authors to identify a quality journal to publish in, helping libraries to highlight open access resources um, to your patrons, helping funders to ensure compliance with open access mandates, helping publishers to increase the visibility and usage of their journals and to adopt best practice, and ideally a better publishing system for everybody. So this is uh, a chart of the usage of the OAJ. So where do our users come from? And about a third of those are from the US, as you can see, but it's very widely used around the world. So we have shared goals between DOAJ and the Library Publishing Coalition and library, um, libraries in general. Um, lots of goals to improve um, impact metrics, to ensure sustainability, to work together um, and to, to um, ensure best practice um, in publishing in open access. So if you haven't got your journal um, in the OAJ already, why would you bother to apply? So if you want um, a higher visibility for your journal, um, more discoverability of the content. You will get that from DOAJ because when you put your journal into DOAJ and ideally your metadata, um, there are many people around the world who are using that content on in their services. So your journal content will be found in many more places. If you're accepted for DOJ, you're demonstrating um, some quality in your journal, in your processes that have been reviewed. This should enhance the reputation, hopefully attract more authors, and meet the requirements of research funders, which is becoming more and more important these days. Um, so last year, 50, um, research organisations in Europe, which includes research councils from the UK and many other countries, um, put a set of rules together that uh, meant that researchers who wanted to publish the results of their research um, that have been funded by those organisations 
would have to do that in a journal that's been listed in a database like DOAJ or Scopus, Web of Science or PubMed, so in major databases. So this is quite important um, in our you know, fight against um, the poor quality uh, journals that are out there. And when, when research funding, grant funding is not available, many universities uh, now have open access funds that will support the faculty to publish in open access. Um, many of these funds have rules that require publication in, in a journal that's listed by DOAJ. Um, and I found a number of examples of LPC members who've adopted a policy like this. So it's becoming more and more important that an open access journal is reviewed and has a certain level um, of quality um, before people will pay to be included. So before you start, there's a number of basic requirements for inclusion in DOAJ. And the first of these is that we only include the full open access journals, not hybrid journals. So only journals where all full text is immediately available to everybody with no embargo. And there's no subscription content. We do allow um, publishers to produce a print issue um, for subscription. That's especially common in places like India. Um, but the online content must all be available immediately. Um, we want all the content in DOAJ to be uh, peer reviewed. Um, it's not something I think that was part of the criteria right at the beginning. Um, so as part of our drive towards ensuring quality of the journals in the system, um, we have a requirement now that a journal undergoes peer review. A journal should also publish um, original research or review papers in full text, so we don't accept um, an abstracts only uh, publication. The primary audience of our content um, or the journals um, is researchers um, and will um, review and accept journals in, in any disciplines and any languages. So there's no um, limits there. So you can apply from the DOAJ website very easily. There is a form um, that you can get to from any page. And the process um, that is followed um, takes a number of steps. So it takes some time um, to review. Um, the first part is that one of our team will check that there is an ISSN for the journal and we don't accept any journal where there is no ISSN. Once past that phase, the team will evaluate the journal according to our criteria um, and that will be our team of volunteers or one of our staff or one of our ambassadors who are currently working um, for the IGRC project. They will make a recommendation um, to approve or reject a journal and one of the editorial team will make the final decision um, and award the DOAJ seal if appropriate and then we'll provide feedback back um, to the publisher, um, particularly in the case of rejection, um, to let them know why uh, they failed to be included. So this shows how many countries have actually sent the most applications in to DOJ in the last couple of years. Um, India being at the top of the list, um, and India also has a high number of predatory or what we prefer to call questionable um, publishers. 
So we need to be very careful now when we uh, review journals, um, which is why we implemented strict criteria for entry and required the applications um, for journals that were already in the system. So I'm just going to quickly highlight some of the areas where we see the most problems, particularly for good journals that we would expect to come from um, organizations like members of the LPC. Um, and the area where we reject the most content or the most journals is um, that there isn't an ISSN that's registered um, at the International ISSN Centre. We check on, on their database at ISSN.org. Um, and it is not uncommon um, for a journal not to have been fully registered when they apply to DOAJ. So that's something to be aware of if you are applying um, for entry into the system is to make sure that the journal is fully registered at ISSN.org first. And then there won't be an excessive delay due to the journal being um, rejected first. And you might think it's pretty obvious that you'd put a publisher name and address and contact details. Um, but for some questionable journals, that information may be obscure or unavailable. And it's a, an additional check that we um, would make um, to ensure that um, the journals are reasonable and, and should be included. Um, in terms of content, we need um, the content to be available on an article by article basis. Um, in fact, I reviewed a journal today that was only available um, as one PDF for the issue, um, and so that couldn't be accepted as it was. Um, <clears throat> and we like to have a minimum of five scholarly articles published per year to ensure that there's a regular publishing flow, not that you know 10 is published one year and then the next year and then three the next year. Um, we will we will show some um, consideration for very niche journals that don't publish very many, so um, you can always ask us if you have any queries on that score. Um, journal information, you would expect always to have aims and scope and instructions for authors, um, but there's a couple of areas that um, we need additional information. Um, for the sake of transparency. Um, we like to have some information on the peer review process that is undertaken um, by the journal. Um, for instance, whether it's um, blind or double blind, how many reviewers, that kind of thing. Um, and also bec because some journals don't include author information and there have been you know, stories that people have uh, sent in a, a paper and then been charged unexpectedly by um, some more unscrupulous journals, um, we require that you need to state that there are no author fees if there are no author fees and you must put all that information out so that it's clear to a prospective author um, what they're going to be charged, if anything. You'd expect a journal is going to have an editor um, and an editorial board, um, ideally with at least five members, and who are experts in the field. Again, this seems entirely self-evident, um, but again, it's a check against the journals that may be somewhat less scrupulous, um, and they may include people on their boards without their knowledge. So again, we have to be careful when we're reviewing to make sure um, that the editorial boards are genuine and up to date and active. Um, so we ask for affiliations to be shown for members so that we can um, do a check if needed and also so that anyone using the journal is aware of who the editorial board are. The editorial process 
I said we only accept peer-reviewed journals now. So obviously to demonstrate that you've got um, rigorous quality control, um, your journal should be peer-reviewed by external reviewers, not journal staff, before publication. As I said, the type of review should be stated. Um, although there is an exception, of course, um, in that arts and humanities journals, um, we will allow editorial review by two editors and no editorial board. So that was really about you know, general journal policies. Um, and we move on to specifics for open access. So, as I said before, the full text of all content must be available as open access with no delay or embargo. This must be clearly stated on the website for transparency, so everybody is aware of what your policy is. Um, and ideally, we'd like that to be on the journal homepage or certainly linked from there. So we go by the Budapest Open Access Initiative definition. Um, and an example uh, open access statement might be something like this. Um, so it's clear to anybody um, coming to the journal website that the, all the content is freely available. Um, and it will tell, your statement should tell the users what they are allowed to do um, with the content. Um, I've underlined um, other lawful purpose because that leads into the next um, session on uh, licensing because one of the things people are worried about is that you put a statement like this and, and you think that perhaps users can use the content for anything at all. Um, but what's lawful is dependent on how you've licensed that content so that the terms of the use and the reuse of the journal content is clear both to the authors who will be publishing with the journal and the readers um, who are using it. So we recommend uh, Creative Commons licenses. Um, and from their range of licenses, you can choose how open your content can be. So funding agencies commonly mandate use of the most open license, which is CCBY, the attribution license. But you could restrict to allow only non-commercial use, for instance. Um, and there are six licenses. Um, with a, a range of um, openness, um, and the, the most restrictive uh, at the bottom of the screen here is uh, essentially doesn't allow any um, remixing or creation of derivative products, which is what the ND part means, and doesn't allow any commercial use. So as you can see from this, you can, you can actually be quite restrictive within the Creative Commons palette. Copyright is always a complicated issue, as we find often when we're reviewing journals. Um, copyright may be retained by the authors, and that is the preferred situation in, in open access. But it may be transferred to the publisher, as happened in traditional subscription publishing. Um, and certainly many commercial publishers still require the transfer of copyright um, and may require the transfer of other publishing rights such as commercial rights. Um, so this is obviously, this is often made by a commercial, a, a publishing agreement. Um, so it's, it's very important for an, an author to be aware of what they're signing over in any publishing agreement. And this is something that, again, we check um, when we're reviewing journals for inclusion in DOHA. 
So moving on to best practice, um, there are guidelines available um, uh, at COPE, um, at OASPA, and there's the principles of transparency and best practice in scholarly publishing um, that DOAJ co-authored with COPE, OASPA, and the World Association of Medical Editors. So those are all good resources um, to see what best practice is um, for open access publishing and how you might adopt some of those best practice guidelines um, in your journals. So we award something called the DOAJ seal um, for best practice. And that's based on seven criteria that we have relating to um, various aspects of publishing, like accessibility, openness, discoverability, authors' rights. And all of those seven criteria must be met in order to be awarded the seal. But it's important to note that the seal doesn't reflect in any way the academic quality of the journal. We're not looking at the, the content per se we're looking at the processes and procedures um, that surround uh, the journal publishing. So we list these criteria um, for the seal on the application form. Um, and you can see that at any point. Um, and I'm just going to go through each one individually. Um, there's a there's quite a common misconception that you need to meet all these criteria in order to be indexed in DOIJ. Um, and that's not the case. Obviously, there are basic criteria to be included. This is an extra um, that we would hope that journals would aspire to, but are not required to be in DOAJ. There's many journals that um, adhere to some of these points, but for some reason cannot um, meet all the requirements. They don't get the, the seal. So the first one, and one of the ones that I'm particularly um, in favour of, given that uh, in my previous jobs I worked very closely with uh, LOX, LOX and Portico, um, is digital archiving. When you're publishing online, um, it's, it's very easy for that content to be lost. We found it in, on many occasions with journals that were in DOAJ and have disappeared completely, which is you know, disappointing for someone who wanted to read that journal and for people who published in that journal. So um, we obviously recommend that you use one of the key archiving services or the Digital Preservation Service of the National Library um, or if your journal fits uh, the subject matter, um, PubMed Central is also uh, a service that would qualify for the SEAL. And unfortunately, um, an institutional server repository doesn't qualify um, at the moment because mostly those um, don't have the very long-term preservation um, arrangements. Uh, permanent identifiers um, is the second of the criteria to ensure that articles remain discoverable even when content moves. And obviously, the, the most common of those is the DOI, although others may be used, like Handle and ARC. We encourage metadata supply to DOAJ. As you saw earlier, there was about 6,500 journals who have supplied us with metadata for their articles. Uh, we believe this is a good thing because it provides greater visibility and discoverability for the journals. Um, 
and we ask for that metadata delivery to start within three months of acceptance of a journal. Um, and you can supply that um, by XML um, using a file or, or our new API. Um, although if you did have quite a small journal, there is a form where you could you can upload um, data into the form individually for each article. Obviously, that only works if you have a very small journal. Going back to Creative Commons, um, because we believe it's a right to allow generous reuse and remixing of open access content, only four of the six Creative Commons licenses qualify for the seal, and the two most restrictive, um, the non non-derivative licenses don't qualify because they don't allow remixing and the creation of derivative products. Ideally, um, that license information should be available in machine readable format um, and embedded in the article level metadata so that someone can find an article and know instantly what they're permitted to do with that content. It's also a, a safeguard for the author or the publisher um, that when someone finds an article maybe held elsewhere, not on their website, that uh, the license information would be with it and visible to any user at that point. So again, that's any of those four Creative Commons licenses. And here's an example of what it might look like. So there's a, the CCBY logo um, and the description and a link at the bottom of that page. So ideally, you always want to link back to the original license text. Um, as well. Um, so I talked earlier about copyright and that our preferred um, position was would be that authors would hold the copyright of the articles that they publish. So to meet the the DOIJ seal. Um, a journal must allow authors to hold both the copyright and the publishing rights without restriction, um, which means the copyright is retained by the author and not transferred to the journal, and they do not assign exclusive publishing rights to the publisher or transfer commercial rights to the publisher. Um, a publisher can have non-exclusive publishing rights, and that is absolutely fine. Um, but uh, if exclusive publishing rights are transferred, then the author doesn't then hold um, these rights without restriction. And effectively, their copyright is meaningless if all the rights have been transferred to the publisher. As I said, that commonly happens with, with uh, the commercial publishers, particularly moving from a traditional subscription um, base into open access publishing. And finally, um, to get the, the DOAJ seal, um, we ask that a journal provides information on the self-archiving rights for an author, so what the author can do um, with their paper before acceptance and after acceptance, and where they can where they can archive that on their institutional repository or perhaps a subject repository like Archive. And the most common um, place for that uh, policy information to be held is Sherpa Romeo uh, service, which is run out of the UK. Um, and the next slide just shows an example 
of what a record would look like um, on Sherpa, showing where the author can archive their preprint and their postprint, whether they can use the publisher's version and any other conditions that surround um, what they're allowed to do. So if you're looking at DOAJ um, and you're perhaps looking at a list of journals, you'll see a couple of logos. The DOAJ seal logo will appear where that's been awarded. And there's also a little green check or tick as we call it in the UK. Um, and that shows that the journal has been evaluated against the stricter criteria that we introduced um, a couple of years ago. In this example, the journal in the middle doesn't have either. If it doesn't have a green tick, it means it hasn't been evaluated against the more stringent criteria. So that is something to be aware of when you're looking at DOJ, that until we have fully reviewed all of the journals that we applied for listing, some of those journals that are in the system may not meet those criteria. And when we have finished that re-evaluation, everything in the system would have a green tick against that. But we have a little way to go before that point. So there's information on DOAJ available at various places on our website. Um, and there's a help email address at feedback at doaj.org, which you can contact any time if you have any questions. Um, so all that remains for me to say is to thank you, thank all the members who support the work of DOAJ because without them, we couldn't do the work that we do. Um, and our members include over 60 libraries in the US and Canada. Um, three consortia, and that does include many uh, members of the LPC. So for that, we thank you very, very much. Um, we also have a number of sponsors, and you know we really couldn't do it without all of you. So that is the end of my presentation, and I'm ready to answer any questions that you've got. Um, and I hope that there have been some while I've been talking. So, over to you, Kate, if there's any questions. Yes, thank you so much, Judith. This was really um, super helpful to me, and I'm sure to everybody else who is listening. Uh, does anyone have a question that they either want to type in or that they would like to unmute and, and ask? While, uh, while others are thinking, I will ask my question. So okay. we, have, um, we have a journal here at the University of Minnesota that we've been working with that um, one of the editorial board uh, members is strongly opposed to a blanket CC license um, because he wants to know who's using his work. He, he wants to say yes to everyone, but he wants them to contact him. Um, and you know, the, of course, they're competing with that idea against wanting to be included in DOAJ. Uh, and so I wonder if you have any suggestions for how to approach a situation like that. Oh, yes, that's quite tricky, isn't it? <laughs> um, well, I guess, I guess the best thing I could suggest is um, Given that the principles of open access are really that people can use the content without having to ask permission, um, that if you applied one of the more restrictive CC licenses, um, at least somebody would have to contact the author if they wanted to reuse that content um, in another article or in a derivative product. So if you used one of the ND licenses, 
they wouldn't be allowed to reuse that content um, to create something new. And in that case, they would have to go back to the author and ask for his permission. So I think that would probably be um, my best suggestion because you can't really ask for everyone who may download that article and read it to ask for his permission first. Yeah, and, and that's what he he really wants because he wants to know who else is working in the field. He wants to make those connections. Um, you know, he he had a compelling argument for himself personally as a scholar of why he wanted it. Uh, but I like that idea of trying to make it as restricted as possible to that that would encourage encourage it. So thank you. That's okay. Uh, Hopefully it will help. <laughs> <laughs> there is a question that came in um, through the chat that said, how often, or it's from Purdue, um, how often or at what point do journals need to reapply to DOAJ? Um, well, we've we've gone through this process of asking journals to reapply um, against our more restrictive criteria. Um, we don't have any plans to set up a regular reapplication process, but it's only something that we'll be looking at, kind of re-evaluating journals. Um, in you know on a regular basis maybe a couple of years but we don't expect to be asking um, journals to formally reapply um, hopefully it's something that we'll be able to manage um, on an ongoing basis without having to go through this whole reapplication process again in future so it's it's a bit of a vague answer but um Essentially, um, if if the Purdue journals have reapplied um, and have been accepted into DOAJ, um, there is nothing else for them to do at this stage, or or any time soon. Okay. Um, we also had a question from Lisa Palmer. Um, she wrote, we first submitted our journal for reapplication back in December 2015. When can we expect to hear from the DOAJ editorial team? Well, that is an excellent question. We have about 3,000 journals um, who have reapplied um, that we still have to review. So um, it is fairly difficult to, um, to give an accurate statement we are I mean we have a very very small team because we have a limited budget um, and we are working through as fast as possible but I think if I'm honest um, the time taken to uh, review all of the reapplications was um, underestimated um, initially so um, we will get to it as quickly as we can um, and if there is a, a pressing reason why you need uh, the reapplication to be done um, quickly then obviously we can look at doing that um, but as I say we have 3,000 still to do so <laughs> it's um, it's quite a massive list so we're trying to um, to be fairly fair and do a, a mixture of reapplications from different countries, different sizes of publishers, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I would hope it won't be too long before we get to, to Purdue. Um, and I think actually, you know, I think it's a good point for me to, to state that, you know, given that I'm talking to you and you know who I am now, you know, if if any of the members have any questions about reapplications that they have in the system, um, then please feel free to contact me um, either via the feedback uh, email address or um, you can you can reach me at judith at doaj.org and I'll be happy to to look at specific journal queries if if you want me to. 
Thank you. And um, a quick follow-up on that. How does that, um, the, the, the reapplication, how does that, how are you meshing those in with the new applications? Is that all <laughs> to the same queue or is, does one take priority over the other? No, they they are the same the same queue. I mean, what we what we try, we've always tried to say that we will um, review new applications uh, within six months. I mean, ideally, we'd like it to be quicker. Um, and you know, in future, when we finish the reapplications, I'm sure it can be quicker. So we have we have a target to, to try and meet for the new applications. So we are trying to do a mixture of both, um, and uh, it's it's a challenge, as <laughs> we say. But um, um, we are we are trying to uh, make sure that we are not doing one set of uh, journals at the expense of the other. Okay. Thank you. And then it looks like Emma Moles has a question that she was going to ask. Yeah. Hi, Judith. Um, I have a question specifically related to um, Library Publishing Coalition and um, related to sort of the backlog of reapplications and new applications. I was wondering if there was anywhere, any way as a coalition we could um, sort of help out or expedite some of, some of those processes. I mean, I know you have a list of um, members, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm guessing Elsevier does quite a bit of work before they send stuff to you. Um, you know, is, is there any kind of collaborative thing that we could do as an organized group of people and publishers that, that would make more uh, sense as far as time goes? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, I suppose, um, I mean, there's a couple of things that come to mind. I mean, obviously, um, if any of you want to volunteer with us, that will be very welcome, and that will help to move things on. Um, but I think, um, you know, perhaps using this session as a start, um, you know, we we could have a almost like a template for how to um, apply for your journals. Um, to DOAJ, and then obviously the reviews for those journals would be quicker. For instance, um, if you knew um, before you applied that we're not going to accept a journal if it doesn't state what the peer review process is, or it doesn't state whether there are any author fees, then obviously you could ensure that you have all the correct information before you apply. It's it's you know extremely common and in fact it's more more the case than not that we do have to go back to our publisher um and ask them questions before we can accept a journal. Um even the big publishers, you know, elsewhere. I I was um, dealing with some queries from Wiley today. So, you know, they're not, um, the big publishers not necessarily any better <laughs> at including all the information that they need. Um, so, as an initial thought, I would, you know, I would think that, you know, if you, you know, perhaps as members have, you know, have a checklist and say, well, if you, um, if you're going to apply to DOAJ, make sure that you have all these things um, before you do it. Then the review should be a lot more straightforward, and hopefully you'd get a decision more quickly. Great, thanks. And I actually have uh, one more question that's not related, a little bit more technical of a question. Um, does DOAJ add any um, open access indicators into its metadata that it's then pushing out by way of API or open URL? And I'm, I'm also wondering about the, the green check and the seal that's included. Is that um, metadata field that's included, or are you using NISO's open access indicators at all? 
That is a really good question. And if Don was here, he'd be able to answer that straight away. Um, <laughs> but um, I'm not as familiar with the metadata format as I'd like to be. Um, so I will ask him and I'll have to get back to you on that one. I'm writing it down as we speak. Um, there was another question that came in online uh, that said, if a journal's application is rejected, is there a required waiting period before reapplication? Yes. Generally, uh, the waiting period is uh, six months. Um, it may be longer if we find any indicators of poor editorial practices, shall we say. Um, but generally at six months, although I would say that particularly if, if the reason for rejection is um, an ISSN issue, um, which is just incredibly common because um, in, in a lot of instances, a publisher doesn't even know that their journal isn't fully registered. Um, it could be um, an issue between um, the local ISSN centre that they've used to register it and the international centre. Um, so if it's if that's the only reason for rejection, um, then we will quite often just um, reopen that um, application and then work on it. If the publisher has come to us and said, we believe that the ISSN issue is now fixed, um, we'll check it again and we can reopen it at that point. But yeah, the ISSN thing is, is a problem. I, I had a, a journal not long ago um, that I wrote and told them that uh, it, the ISSN wasn't registered and we, we couldn't take the journal. And they hadn't realised that it wasn't fully registered for two years, I think. So <laughs> it's um it can be it can be a big problem. Uh, another question came in online from Allegra Swift. Uh, she said, "I'm resubmitting our journals. We do have one in the metadata record in DOAJ." She said, "We do have one, but the metadata record in DOAJ is incorrect." How do we amend it? Um, it depends whether she means the metadata for the journal or for the individual articles. Um, if it's uh, article um, metadata that's wrong, then um, you would need to resupply that um, correct metadata. Um, ask us to delete the incorrect metadata and then re-upload. Um, the article data. If it's um, that some of the details about the journal are wrong, um, then there's two ways that we can deal with that. One is if your reapplication is still in progress, then that um, information will be corrected once the reapplication is completed and your journal is accepted for continued listing. Or if the journal has already been uh, assessed and the reapplication has been successful, if there's some content or there's some information that's wrong, simply send us an email to feedback at doaj.org um, and we'll get that corrected. Oh, great. Um, she did add it was for the journal. Uh, okay. Thank you to that answer, so that's perfect. Does anybody else have a question that they'd like addressed today? All right, uh, I'm not seeing anything come across the chat. So once again, I'd like to thank you, Judith, for your time and really great presentation. Super, super helpful to all of us. Um, it's a pleasure. And, uh, and look forward to more webinars coming out of the Library Publishing Coalition Professional Development Committee. We have a couple more teed up for this winter that we'll be sending out to the list. 
We always appreciate your ideas for other sessions that um, are of interest to you that we can research speakers or ideas for speakers. Please um, reach out to any members of the committee, um, you can reach out to me or, or anyone. We're listed on the website for the Library Publishing Coalition. So thanks again, Judith. And uh, uh, this session is recorded. Um, and uh, that will be posted, and I believe that Courtney from Educopia will be posting that and sending out a message. Um, I don't know, um, we got a question about will we receive a copy of the slides. Um, do you, would you plan on posting those, Judith, or do, would you want to share those with us? We, can um, put we, we, normally, um, we normally put our slides onto SlideShare. Um, so if I can arrange to do that and then um, provide a link if that would suit. Yeah, that would be great. And then I can send it out to our membership. Okay, excellent. Wonderful. So I'll plan on doing that. Um, well, thanks again. And uh, have a good rest of your day, everyone. And Judith, you get to leave work now. Thank you for staying <laughs> late in order to be able to talk to us overseas. <laughs> All right. Love All you right. to do it. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.